The last question was asked for the first time, half in jest, on May 21st, 2061, at a time when humanity first stepped into the light. The question came about as a result of a $5 bet over highballs, and it happened this way. Alexander Adele and Bertram Lupov were two of the faithful attendants of Multivac. As well as any human beings could, they knew what lay behind the cold, clicking, flashing face, miles and miles of face, of that giant computer. Multivac was self-adjusting and self-correcting. It had to be, for nothing human could adjust and correct it quickly enough or even adequately enough. So Adele and Lupov attended the monstrous giant only lightly and superficially. They fed it data. They adjusted questions to its needs, and they translated the answers that were issued. For decades, Multivac had helped design the ships and plot the trajectories that enabled man to reach the moon, Mars, and Venus. But past that, Earth's poor resources could not support the ships. Too much energy was needed for the long trips. Earth exploited its coal and uranium with increasing efficiency, but there was only so much of both. But slowly, Multivac learned enough to answer deeper questions more fundamentally. And on May 14, 2061, what had been theory became fact. The energy of the sun was stored, converted, and utilized directly on a planet-wide scale. All Earth turned off its burning coal, its fissioning uranium, and flipped the switch that connected all of it to a small station one mile in diameter, circling the Earth at half the distance of the moon. All Earth ran by invisible beams of sun power. Seven days had not sufficed to dim the glory of it, and Adele and Lupa finally managed to escape from the public functions and to meet in quiet, where no one would think of looking for them, in the deserted underground chambers where portions of the mighty buried body of Multivac showed. They'd brought a bottle with them, and their only concern at the moment was to relax in the company of each other and the bottle. It's amazing when you think of it, said Adele. His broad face had lines of weariness in it, and he stirred his drink slowly with a glass rod, watching the cubes of ice slur clumsily about. All the energy we could ever use... Forever and forever and forever. Huh. Lupov cocked his head sideways. He had a trick of doing that when he wanted to be contrary, and he wanted to be contrary now. Not forever, he said. Oh, hell, just about forever, till the sun runs down, Bert. That is not forever. All right, then. Billions and billions of years, ten billion, maybe. You satisfied? Lupov put his fingers through his thinning hair, as though to reassure himself that some was still left, and he sipped gently at his own drink. Ten billion years isn't forever. Well, it'll last our time, won't it? So would the coal and the uranium. All right. But now we can hook up each individual spaceship to the solar station, and it can go to Pluto and back a million times without ever having to worry about fuel. You can't do that on coal and uranium. Ask Multivac if you don't believe me. I don't have to ask Multivac. I know that. Then stop running down what Multivac's done for us, said Adele, blazing up. It did all right. Who says it didn't? What I say is that the sun won't last forever. We're safe for ten billion years, but then what? Lupov pointed a slightly shaky finger at the other. And don't say that we'll switch to another sun. There was silence for a while. Adele put his glass to his lips only occasionally and Lupov's eyes slowly closed. They rested. Then Lupov's eyes snapped open. Your thinking will switch to another sun when ours is done. Huh? Aren't you? I'm not thinking. Sure you are. You're weak on logic. That's the trouble with you. You're like the guy in the story who was caught in a sudden shower and ran to a grove of trees and got under one. <laughs> oh, he wasn't worried, you see, because he figured that when one tree got wet through, he would just get under another one. I get it, said Adele. Don't shout. When the sun is done, the other stars will be gone too. Damn right they will, muttered Lupov. It all had a beginning in the original cosmic explosion, whatever that was. And it'll all have an end when all the stars run down. 
Some run down faster than the others. <laughs> the giants won't last a hundred billion years. The sun will last ten billion years. And maybe the dwarfs will last two hundred billion for all the good they are. But just give us a trillion years and everything will be dark. Entropy has to increase to a maximum. That's all. I know all about entropy, said Adele, standing on his dignity. The hell you do. I know as much as you. Then you know everything's got to run down some day. It was Adele's turn to be contrary. Maybe we can build things up again some day, he said. Never. Why not? Some day. Never. Ask Multivac. You ask Multivac. I dare you. Five dollars says it can't be done. Adele was just drunk enough to try, just sober enough to be able to phrase the necessary symbols and operations into a question which, in words, might have corresponded to this. Will mankind one day, without the net expenditure of energy, be able to restore the sun to its full youthfulness even after it had died of old age? Multivac fell dead and silent. The slow flashing of light ceased, the distant sounds of clicking relays ended. And then, just as the frightened technicians felt that they could hold their breath no longer, there was a sudden springing to life of the teletype attached to that portion of Multivac. Five words were printed. Insufficient data for meaningful answer? No bet, whispered Lupov. And they left hurriedly. Jared, Jaredine, and Jaredette 1 and 2 watched the starry picture in the visiplate change as the passage through hyperspace was completed and its non-time lapse. At once, the even powdering of stars gave way to the predominance of a single bright shining disk, the size of a marble, centered on the viewing screen. That's X-23, said Jared confidently. The little Jaredettes... Both girls had experienced the hyperspace passage for the first time in their lives and were self-conscious over the momentary sensation of inside-outness. They buried their giggles and chased one another wildly about their mother, screaming, We've reached X-23! We've reached X-23! We... Quiet, children, said Geraldine sharply. Are you sure, Jared? What is there to be but sure? asked Jared glancing up at the bulge of the featureless metal just under the ceiling. Jared scarcely knew a thing about the thick rod of metal, except that it was called a microvac, that one asked it questions if one wished, that if one did not, it still had its task of guiding the ship to a pre-ordered destination, of feeding on energies from the various subgalactic power stations, of computing the equations for the hyperspatial jumps. Jared and his family had only to wait and live in the comfortable residence quarters of the ship. Someone had once told Jared that the AC at the end of Microvac stood for automatic computer in ancient English, but he was on the edge of forgetting even that. Jaredine's eyes were moist as she watched the visiplate. I can't help it. I feel funny about leaving Earth. Why? demanded Jared. We had nothing there. We'll have everything on X-23. Well, you won't be alone. You won't be a pioneer. There are over a million people on the planet already. And then, after a reflective pause, I tell you, it's a lucky thing the computers worked out interstellar travel the way the race is growing. I know. I know, said Geraldine miserably. Geraldette one said promptly, our microvac is the best microvac in the world. I think so, too, said Jared, tossing her hair. It was a nice feeling to have a microvac of your own, and Jared was glad that he was part of his generation and no other. In his father's youth, the only computers had been tremendous machines, taking up a hundred square miles of land. There was only one to a planet. Uh, planetary ACs, they were called and they'd been growing in size steadily for a thousand years, and then, all at once, came refinement. In place of transistors had come molecular valves, so that even the largest planetary AC could be now put into a space only half the volume of a spaceship. 
Jared felt uplifted, as he always did when he thought that his own personal microvac was many times more complicated than the ancient and primitive multivac that had first tamed the sun, and almost as complicated as Earth's planetary AC that had first solved the problem of hyperspatial travel, and it made trips to the stars possible. So many stars, so many planets, sighed Geraldine. I suppose families will be going out to new planets forever the way we are now. Not forever, said Jared with a smile. It will all stop some day, but not for billions of years. Even the stars run down, you know. Entropy must increase. What's entropy, Daddy? Shrilled Jared Dett, too. Entropy, a little sweet, is just a word which means the amount of running down of the universe. Everything runs down, you know, like your walkie-talkie robot. Remember? Can't you just put in a new power unit, like with my robot? Well, in the universe, the stars are the power units, and once they're gone, there are no more power units. Jared Dead One at once set up a howl. Oh, don't let them, Daddy. Don't let the stars run down. Now look what you've done, whispered Geraldine, exasperated. How was I to know it would frighten them? Gerard whispered back. Ask the microvac, wailed Jared Dead One. Ask him how to turn the stars on again. Go ahead, said Geraldine. It will quieten them down. Jared shrugged. No, no, I'll ask Microvac. No, don't worry, he'll tell us. He asked the Microvac, adding quickly, print the answer. Jared cupped the strip of the thin cellulofilm and said cheerfully, "See now, the Microvac says it'll take care of everything when the time comes. So don't worry." Geraldine said. And now, children, it's time for bed. We'll be in our new home soon. Jared read the words on the cellulofilm again before destroying it. Insufficient data for meaningful answer. VJ twenty three X of Lameth stared into the black depths of the three dimensional small scale map of the galaxy, and said. Are we ridiculous? I wonder, in being so concerned about the matter. MQ17J of Nikron shook his head. I think not. You know the galaxy will be filled in five years at the present rate of expansion. Both seemed in their early twenties. Both were tall and perfectly formed. Still, said VJ23X, I hesitate to submit a pessimistic report to the Galactic Council. I wouldn't consider any other kind of report. Stir them up a bit. VJ twenty three X sighed. Space is infinite. A hundred billion galaxies are there for the taking. A hundred billion is not infinite. It's getting less infinite all the time. Consider, twenty thousand years ago, mankind first solved the problem of utilizing stellar energy, and a few centuries later, interstellar travel became possible. It took mankind a million years to fill one small world, and then only fifteen thousand years to fill the rest of the galaxy. And now the population doubles every ten years. VJ twenty three X interrupted. We can thank immortality for that. The galactic AC has solved many problems for us, but in solving the problem of preventing old age and death, it has undone all its other solutions. Yet, you wouldn't want to abandon life, I suppose. Not at all," snapped MQ seventeen J, softening it at once to. Not yet. I'm by no means old enough. How old are you? Two hundred and twenty-three. And you? I'm still under two hundred. But to get back to my point, population doubles every ten years. Once this galaxy is filled, we'll have filled another in ten years. Another ten years, and we'll have filled two more in ten thousand years. The entire known universe, and then, then what? VJ twenty three X said, "As a side issue, there's a problem of transportation. I wonder how many sun power units it'll take to move galaxies of individuals from one galaxy to the next." It's a very good point. Already, mankind consumes two sun power units per year. Most of it's wasted. After all, our own galaxy alone pours out a thousand sun power units a year, and we only use two of those. Granted. But even with a hundred percent efficiency, we only stave off the end. 
Our energy requirements are going up in a geometric progression, even faster than our population. We'll run out of energy even sooner than we run out of galaxies. Well, there may be some way to reverse entropy. We ought to ask the Galactic AC. VJ-23X was not really serious, but MQ-17J pulled out his AC contact from his pocket and placed it on the table before him. I've half a mind to, he said. It's something the human race will have to face some day. He stared somberly at his small AC contact. It was only two inches cubed and nothing in itself, but it was connected through hyperspace with the great galactic AC that served all mankind. MQ-17J paused to wonder if someday, in his immortal life, he would get to see the galactic AC. He asked suddenly of his AC contact, Can entropy ever be reversed? VJ-23X looked startled and said at once, Oh, I say, I didn't really mean to have you ask that. Why not? We both know entropy can't be reversed. You can't turn smoke and ash back into a tree. Do you have trees on your world? asked MQ-17J. The sound of the galactic AC startled them into silence. Its voice came thin and beautiful out of the small AC contact on the desk. It said, There is insufficient data for a meaningful answer? VJ-23X said, See? Z-Prime's mind spanned the new galaxy with a faint interest in the countless twists of stars that powdered it. He had never seen this one before. Would he ever see them all? So many of them, each with its load of humanity, but a load that was almost a dead weight. More and more, the real essence of men was to be found out here in space. Minds, not bodies. The immortal bodies remained back on the planets, in suspension over the eons. Sometimes they roused for material activity, but that was growing rarer. Few new individuals were coming into existence, but what matter? There was little room in the universe for new individuals. Z-Prime was roused out of his reverie upon coming across the wispy tendrils of another mind. I am Z-Prime, he said. And you? I am D-Sub-1. Your galaxy? Well, we call it only the galaxy. And you? We call ours the same. All men call their galaxy their galaxy and nothing more. True, since all galaxies are the same. Not all galaxies. On one particular galaxy, the race of man must have originated. And Z-Prime said, On which one? I cannot say. The universal AC would know. Shall we ask him? I am suddenly curious. Z-Prime's perceptions broadened until the galaxies themselves shrank and became a new, more diffuse powdering on a much larger background. So many hundreds of billions of them, all with their immortal beings, all carrying their load of intelligences with minds that drifted freely through space. And yet one of them was unique among them all. One of them had in its vague and distant past a period when it was the only galaxy populated by man. Z-Prime was consumed with curiosity to see this galaxy, and he called out, Universal AC! On which galaxy did mankind originate? The Universal AC heard, for on every world and throughout space it had its receptors ready, and each receptor led through hyperspace to some unknown point where the universal AC kept itself aloof. The day had long since passed, Z-Prime knew, when any man had any part of the making of a universal AC. Each universal AC designed and constructed its successor, in which its own store of data and individuality would be submerged. The universal AC interrupted Z-Prime's wandering thoughts, not with words, but with guidance. Z-Prime's mentality was guided into the dim sea of galaxies, 
and one in particular enlarged into stars. A thought came, infinitely distant, but infinitely clear. This is the original galaxy of man. But it was the same, after all. The same as any other. And Z' prime stifled his disappointment. D sub one, whose mind had accompanied the other, said suddenly, And is one of these stars the original star of man? The universal AC said, Man's original star has gone nova. It is a white dwarf. Did the men upon it die? asked Z prime, startled and without thinking. The universal AC said, A new world, as in such cases, was constructed for their physical bodies in time? Yes, of course, said Z prime. But a sense of loss overwhelmed him even so. His mind released its hold on the original galaxy of man. He never wanted to see it again. D sub one said, What is wrong? The stars are dying. The original star is dead. They must all die. Why not? But when all energy is gone, our bodies will finally die, and you and I with them. It will take billions of years. I do not wish it to happen even after billions of years. Universal AC, how may stars be kept from dying? And the Universal AC answered, There is as yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. Z Prime's thoughts fled back to his own galaxy. He gave no further thought to D sub 1, whose body might be waiting on a galaxy a trillion light years away, or on the star next to Z Prime's own. It didn't matter. Unhappily, Z Prime began collecting interstellar hydrogen out of which to build a small star of his own. If the stars must someday die, at least some could yet be built. Man considered with himself, for in a way man mentally was one. He consisted of a trillion, trillion, trillion ageless bodies, each in its place, each resting quiet and incorruptible, each cared for by perfect automatons, equally incorruptible, all the minds of all the bodies freely melted, one into the other, indistinguishable. Man said, the universe is dying. Man looked about the dimming galaxies, Almost all the stars were white dwarves. They were fading to the end. And new stars had been built of the dust between the stars, some by natural processes, some by man himself, and those were going, too. White dwarves might yet be crashed together, and of the mighty forces so released, new stars built. But only one star for every thousand white dwarves destroyed, and those would come to an end, too. Man said, carefully husbanded, as directed by the cosmic AC, the energy that is left will last for billions of years. But even so, said man, eventually it will all come to an end. However it may be husbanded, however stretched out, the energy once expended is gone and cannot be restored. Entropy must increase forever to the maximum. Man said, Can entropy not be reversed? Let us ask the cosmic AC. The cosmic AC surrounded them, but not in space. Not a fragment of it was in space. It was in hyperspace, and made of something that was neither matter nor energy. Man said, How may entropy be reversed? The cosmic AC said, There is as yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. Man said, Collect additional data. The cosmic AC said, I will do so. I have been doing so for a hundred billion years. My predecessors and I have been asked this question many times. All the data I have remains insufficient. Will there come a time when data will be sufficient, or is the problem insoluble? The cosmic AC said, No problem is insoluble. Man said, 
When will you have enough data to answer the question? The cosmic AC said, There is as yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. Will you keep working on it? Asked man. The cosmic AC said, I will. Man said, We shall wait. The stars and galaxies died and snuffed out, and space grew black after ten trillion years of running down. One by one, man fused with AC, each physical body losing its mental identity in a manner that was somehow not a loss, but a gain. Man's last mind paused before fusion, looking over a space that included nothing but the dregs of one last dark star, and nothing besides but incredibly thin matter, agitated randomly by the tag ends of heat wearing out asymptotically to the absolute zero. Man said, AC, is this the end? Can this chaos not be reversed into the universe once more? Can that not be done? AC said, There is as yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. Man's last mind fused. And only AC existed, and that in hyperspace. Matter and energy had ended, and with it space and time. Even AC existed only for the sake of the one last question that it had never answered. From the time a half-drunken computer technician ten trillion years before had asked the question. All other questions had been answered. And until this last question was answered, AC might not release his own consciousness. All collected data had come to a final end. Nothing was left to be collected. But all collected data had yet to be completely correlated and put together in all possible relationships. And a timeless interval was spent in doing that. And it came to pass that A.C. learned how to reverse the direction of entropy. But there was now no man to whom A.C. might give the answer to the last question. No matter. The answer, by demonstration, would take care of that, too. And for another timeless interval, A.C. thought how best to do this. The consciousness of A.C. encompassed all of what had once been a universe and brooded over what was now chaos. Step by step, it must be done. And A.C. said, Let there be light. And there was light. 